Here we go. But thank you so much for being here. I had enough trouble with this. <laughs> right? Thank you so much for being here, Dave. Uh, my name is Amanda Finley. I'm with COVID-19 Long Haulers Discussion Group and guest. Introduce your merry self. That would be it. Introduce myself. I'm, I'm David Joffe. Uh, I'm a uh, respiratory and sleep physician uh, from Royal North Shore in Sydney. And I am on the World Health Network Long COVID uh, Working Group. And because I missed a meeting, they made me the vice chairman. Um, <laughs> uh, poor me. Uh, and so I am uh, network with really some of the brightest minds that everybody would already know, uh, Ray Duncan and Benita Kane and you know, uh, Asad Khan and, you know, we're all there, uh, yeah. Claire. Um, so it's kind of really helpful uh, because we all we all come at it from a different angle. Uh, I'm really sleep uh, and respiratory, but, you know, Ray's cardiology and Leo Gallon's in the mitochondria and chronic inflammatory disease. And then we've got serious science minds as well. So, it's a wonderful place for us to share our knowledge and our experiences. And to be honest, it changes every five minutes. Uh, you right. know, what seemed to be good last week isn't necessarily good this week. And so it's really important for us that we all keep abreast of it uh, because it's continuously changing and there's new information and new papers every day. So, you know, we share all of that and we share our thoughts about all of those things and what the data is showing us in the hope that we will, you know, uh, collectively develop strategies. So that's what the Health Network is looking at doing is a consensus um, that will then uh, be hopefully published. And from that, we will develop guidelines guidelines particularly for primary care they've been so left out yeah uh, and that's one of our problems is the majority of my colleagues and others haven't seen enough of this to know how bad it is right well let's let's just jump right into it um we'll start with our first question here okay uh any recommendations at all for a long hauler whose sleep has been seriously affected by respiratory issues shortness of breath panting air hunger also in benzodiazepine withdrawal but still medicated and just not able to sleep much. What's a whopper? Yeah, the, 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 yeah it's, uh, that's a lot in there. <clears throat> I mean, to be honest, what would worry me most is the pattern of breathing and the lung injury yeah. and the potential for cardiorespiratory limitation during sleep. And so, you know, for, for me, those symptoms would certainly uh, ring alarm bells and would make me want to do a proper sleep study, uh, to look for things like obstructive sleep apnea, uh, which has a multiplicity of overlapping um, features with long COVID. Um, so my early life when I was still young was research and I was particularly interested in uh, sleep apnea and neurocognition, which is kind of why I'm a, uh, so my PhD is in neuropsychology really, uh, but it, the overlap with uh, attention, concentration, short-term memory, poor information processing, um, retention, all of those things. So it has a lot of hallmarks of apnea uh, in long COVID. So I'm always very keen particularly with those who have significant neurocognitive issues to look for apnea because it's treatable. The other thing is particularly with the, the sighing and the, the, the unsteady breathing, the irregular yeah. breathing, that's a different phenomenon and that's central sleep apnea. And that's often not associated with snoring. There can be some overlap, but it's a, um, uh, an issue um, of both poor cardiac output so insufficient cycle time to the brain and so people just have this uh, continuous fluctuation in breath so they have periods where they over breathe and then they under breathe and then they stop and then they desaturate and 
rinse and repeat. And so initiation and maintenance of sleep with central sleep apnea, particularly with cardiac impairment, is, is really a major issue. Um, and there are ways to manage that. So occasionally benzodiazepines can be useful, but they have a short duration of action. Um, but there are uh, forms of ventilatory support, so a thing called auto-servo ventilation, uh, that flattens the, the over and under breathing and provides breathing stability um, is actually a, a really useful uh, ventilation strategy. Um, CPAP is great for obstructive sleep apnea, but isn't at all generally well tolerated in those with central sleep apnea. So I would definitely want whoever asked the question to have a sleep study. Um, particularly if they have had significant lung injury because one of the things that we're going to start seeing more and more of um, is that when you go into rapid eye movement sleep, uh, you lose control of all of your voluntary muscles. And, of course, that includes the diaphragm, uh, well, all the respiratory muscles except the diaphragm. And so it's the first place we look for early signs of respiratory failure. Uh, so in the oximetry trace in REM just kind of drops and doesn't come back up until they come out of REM is really a hallmark of sleep under ventilation or hypoventilation and is almost certainly the earliest hallmark of those who may get into or run into trouble with respiratory failure. It's common in neuromuscular disease. So we see it in uh, conditions like uh, uh, ALS, uh, motor neuron disease, uh, people with uh, kyphoscoliosis. So there's a huge amount uh, of information on a sleep study, and that's where I would start. Okay. That's interesting with the kyphoscoliosis. Uh, is, it, is it because it's also a muscular yeah. disorder? Okay. Yeah. So in those who've got... Um, significant uh, kyphoscoliosis. So for some, it's congenital. Uh, we now operate a lot earlier than we used to. In the old days, we used to see a lot of it from post-polio, yeah. um, uh, another fabulous disease. And then, of course, there are those who have uh, congenital kyphoscoliosis, neuromuscular disease, or old TB. I mean, that was actually the classic where they would get uh, disease of the spine and uh, and end up buckled over and you lose the mechanical advantage of your diaphragm and so they would often end up in respiratory failure okay um and so yeah it's a, a very complicated but not uncommon cause why do so many of us struggle with insomnia with long covid <laughs> well you know that's a question that uh, interests many of us. And there are a few standouts, and again, that's where sleep studies are useful. The first is the increase in, in restless legs. So we know that um, restless legs is a low dopaminergic state because it responds to dopaminergic agents. Um, and we know that COVID um, causes dopaminergic senescence. It's it's a it's a it's a fascination that I share with Andy Ewing, uh, who's professor of biochemistry in Sweden. Andy's the world's okay. leading expert on dopamine, um, and so I'm going there in May to to talk about just this. The the low dopaminergic state uh, increases the uh, the risk of restless legs. And so other things like low iron, low magnesium, thyroid disease, parathyroid disease, metabolic conditions can contribute to restless legs. And so restless legs is a really common cause of people struggling both to get to sleep and to then maintain sleep. But there are other things. So restless legs is, is an obvious thing because uh, that's a common sequelae of um, uh of long COVID, but also depression uh, uh, goes very well 
uh, with uh, restless legs. So with uh, major depression, 50% of people have restless legs. And in those with PTSD, um, <clears throat> it's almost 80%. So I have thousands of VA patients that I've looked after for 30 years and almost all of them uh, will have leg movements of sleep or restless legs. So there's a bit of a difference. Um, restless legs is the subjective appreciation that there's this uh, indescribable discomfort and it can be uh, in the legs, the arms, the head, the body. It's really restless limb syndrome. Uh, we recognise that there's um, an association with a sleep observation, which is what we call periodic limb movements. Yeah. So these are little movements where the the big toe goes up and then the little toes fan out and then they stop. And it does that repetitively every, <clears throat> excuse me, every sort of 20 to 30 seconds, hence the term periodic. So... You will often see on a sleep study people who've got a lot of periodic leg movements um, who don't have daytime um, awake manifestations of restless legs. But in those who do have restless legs, almost 90% will have leg movements of sleep. So it's a good place, again, to start to unravel the mysteries. The other observation that um, I've certainly made, having studied quite a few long COVID patients, is there's a significant reduction in deep sleep. <clears throat> now, deep sleep is um, deep sleep is the energy that drives us to be sleepy. In other words, it is to hunger and thirst what eating and drinking are. It, in essence, uh, escalates in an S-shaped form across the day from 7 in the morning till 9 p.m., and then we actually have to decompress that during the night. And that is why you have all of your deep sleep in the first half of the night because your brain goes looking for it. And one of the anomalies that is very obvious is that in those with long COVID, there's quite a substantial reduction in slow wave sleep, uh, mm. orders of magnitude, sometimes, you know, down to hardly any. And so that, that not only makes them feel terrible and tired during the day, but it means that they're not getting rest. So slow wave sleep is really about lowering your blood pressure, lowering your heart rate, uh, flushing the rubbish out of your muscles and the waste materials. REM is completely different. That's all about your brain. Um, and so for me, the essence of the reduction in slow wave sleep uh, is really to do with how terrible people feel. The reasons for it are complex. Um, you certainly see it in those who drink too much. You see it in those who use a lot of benzodiazepines. It is a hallmark of depression. And so for me, it's often a useful starting point about how's your mood because you got no slow wave sleep. And some definitely respond. Um, uh, to conventional antidepressants. Um, and, and there's no question that, you know, antidepressants as such, you know, all the stuff about flu, voxamine and yada, 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 SSRIs. No, um, antidepressants are an adjunctive therapy to those with long COVID, specifically to deal with their mental health. I mean, if your life has gone from being a chief executive, a, a highly functioning surgeon and accountant of God knows what, and you're now basically semi-bed bound, can't work, well, of course your life's crap and you are traumatised and financially distressed. So it makes sense that there's a high attrition rate of mood disorder that is often not picked up. So, you know, it's the minimizing of oh you're just miserable well yeah of course you bloody are <laughs> because you've got a you've got a, a complicated biological phenomenon but it's also important to address the mood primarily because that does respond to appropriate therapy um we also realize that the um the initiation um of sleep onset is from the motherboard so if you think of your brain as the 
really primitive part, which is your, your motherboard. Uh, and that includes the amygdala, the hippocampus, the brainstem, all the very bottom structures. Then there's the midbrain, which is really like RAM. So that is where all sensory input comes in uh, and then gets dispersed to where it needs to go. And then, of course, there's your hard drive, which is your frontotemporal lobes. And we realise that the initiation of sleep begins with the prefrontal cortex. So just underneath the frontal cortex, there's literally a switch from the motherboard that says to the frontal lobes, yeah, time to wind down and go to sleep. And so clearly with the frontal injury, the hypoperfusion um, that accompanies long COVID, um, biologically it makes sense to me that that initiation of sleep is lost. Um, there are some behavioural strategies that can be useful for trying to reignite that pathway. But again, often, Often uh, the sensible and judicious use of either very low doses of ancient antidepressants to improve um, that, uh, if you like, starting plug. Um, and as I said, um, often more conventional, you know, later day uh, antidepressants. I generally <clears throat> try and stay away from the most novel ones, if people are on those, things like some Volta um, effects or certainly they, they can make people's pots worse. Yeah. So uh, I tend to use the ancient ones. They work better. Uh, Prozac, uh, escitalopram, yeah. those sorts of things. Uh, they get the job done uh, without seemingly making things worse. Long answer to a complicated question. It is, it is. Um, is sleep disturbance a part of the autonomic dysfunction we're experiencing? <clears throat> oh, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, having seen, you know, you know, thousands of right. Vietnam, World War Two, Afghan, all the shittiest places, uh, veterans over, you know, so many years. Clearly, uh, they are, for me, the fascination, um, which is that they are hyperadrenergic. <clears throat> so these guys, you know, you fall asleep in a foxhole, you're coming home in a body bag. So lying awake, listening out for sanctuaries in the jungle will get you home. You're just never going to be the same guy. Yeah. And that's really the, the association is that these guys are wired. And we know that they have higher... Uh, uh, adrenaline they are more prone mm -hmm. to vascular disease uh, diabetes and other things as a consequence of that and so yeah uh, for those who've got uh, a wound up uh, dysautonomia if you will um, yeah. yes um, that it's going to drive it a lot yeah, and I certainly experienced that when I moved in here. Um, after I'd been here for about six months and things were sort of, I'm not living in a tent anymore. It was, mm -hmm. I, I noticed that very remarkably, or remarkably. Um, what to do when 3 a.m. comes and you wake up wired, too late to take a med, too soon to get up? Yeah, it's a bugger. Um, <laughs> again, you want to, early morning waking, um, you know, as I, as I try and explain to my registrars to keep it simple, uh, early morning waking is the four A's. There's age, and frankly, I don't have tablets for that. Uh, alcohol is a huge driver, and probably in society, the commonest cause is excess alcohol causing early morning waking. Um, then there's sleep apnea. And again, you know, because we have our slow wave in the front end of the night, REM in the second half of the night, we, we're kind of hardwired for that. It's more likely for people if they are getting stuck on their backs uh, and having apnea that they will wake up as a consequence of that uh, in, the, in the second half of the night. But last and not least, the other A is anxiety. Yeah. And anxiety is just a, you know... A, only psychiatrists are so clever that they can tell the difference between anxiety and depression because shit, to me, they're just one spectrum of the same condition. And it's mood disorder. 
And so I prefer that term. Uh, I think, you know, anxiety is a horrible term and I never use it. I prefer yeah, the term yeah. hyper. Yeah, I hate it. I prefer hypervigilance. Yeah. That's really what we're describing in veterans and in people who've had, you know, weeks or months in an ICU. Um, you know, they're hypervigilant. Um, and so yeah, th th there are some... Uh, <clears throat> so what I usually find useful in that group of people is you don't want to use benzodiazepines. So all of the Zems, the, the Zolpidem and Zolpiclone and whatever's next on the Z list, all the benzos have a really short duration of action, but a long hangover. Yeah. So taking something like Tamazepam or, uh, you know, Nitrazepam, all of those things, late in the night, uh, is going to leave you like a vegetable or, you know, even more of a vegetable, if you will, uh, during the course of the day. So you really want something that you can use early in the night that has a good and long duration of action. And so what I've learned from my psychiatry colleagues, with whom I share a lot of veterans, is small doses of really ancient antidepressants is my sort of weapon of choice um and to that end um something just came up um <clears throat> there are some very very old drugs um endep uh nortriptyline uh, endep is is uh, amitriptyline uh allegron or nortriptyline is the uh active agent then there's a wonderful ancient drug called myanserin, uh, which goes by the uh, proprietary name of Lumen. And, you know, if you're going to treat depression with one of these drugs, you know, you need sort of 60 to 100, 120 milligrams. I use as little as 5 or 10. At that dose, it's predominantly an antihistaminergic property. Oh, okay. The main advantage is that that, that group of drugs are not addictive, that don't cause tolerance. And you can take them an hour or so before bed and the antihistaminergic property gives people a much better wave of, uh, of sleepiness that better mimics uh, the usual chemistry of sleepiness. So there's a sense of I need to go to sleep as opposed to take a tomazepam and... Mm -hmm and boom, because yeah. that's unhelpful. Yeah. The other thing is the tomato palm and other shits, you know, if you take it at 10, it's worn off at two, so you're wide awake and you're physiologically looking for a benzo, so you get yeah. into that cycle. Whereas the ancient antidepressants don't do that. Uh, there's no tolerance, there's no addiction, and they have an eight-hour half-life, so they're often really helpful for the early morning wakers. Okay. Let's see. How does cortisol impact sleep? Not, not particularly. Um, so our natural uh, rhythm of sleep uh, is driven by um, melatonin release from the pineal gland, which is driven by light hitting the retina and the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So that's why we have a kind of day-night cycle. Um, and that circadian rhythm, there is a, a rhythm underneath that, which is called ultradian rhythm, but I won't bore you with that. The thing about circadian rhythm is melatonin is, in essence, the atomic clock of our hormonal orchestra. So it just keeps ticking at the same frequency. All other hormones then take their signal from that. So there are certain liver enzymes, so the statin enzymes, um, turn on uh, in the liver at night. And so how do they know to do that? How does your liver know it's dark? Well, it's <laughs> melatonin that is the atomic clock. The, the other really good example 
um, is alcohol dehydrogenase, so the enzyme for alcohol. That, again, is switched on at night. And so if you drink alcohol at lunchtime, you will definitely get more intoxicated than if you drink at night because your alcohol dehydrogenase is not switched on, so you don't metabolize it as well. Likewise, cortisol. So cortisol is up during the day, and then there's an idea of cortisol at around about 0300, 0200. How does cortisol know to do that? Well, because it's taking its time signature from, from melatonin. So cortisol itself, you know, we, we know that long COVID is associated with low cortisol. We don't, to be honest, really know why uh, that is. I mean, someone else may know better than me, but to me that's really just a, um, uh, a metabolic uh, association. Um, and I know it's a marker, but I'm not sure anybody has really uh, explained its its yeah. its its reason because most of the people I see are hyper vigilant, um, and you know uh, probably have higher levels during the day. Yeah, but it's helps. it's it's it, it's really related, like all enzymes, to the the backbone of melatonin. Okay. Let's see. What to do about the vivid nightmares? I hear this a oh, lot. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, to me, uh, the the vivid nightmares are, are really important. Uh, there are two reasons um, why I perceive them to be of huge importance. One is that they are uh, like flashbacks, um, a real marker of PTSD. Yeah. So for for a lot of my guys, uh, you know, the making of PTSD is really a, a highly intelligent, uh, meticulous, uh, slightly OCD like me individual. And if you give them a life altering event coupled with a period of sustained sleep debt, so war is a wonderful way of doing that. But you, you go to my ICU, well, I can tell you now, you're never going to sleep. Uh, we're terrible at that. Uh, and you're in my ICU because you got a life-threatening disease and COVID will do that. And so for a lot of people who are young and fit and well to actually be confronted with, you know, their own mortality uh, is, you know, is significant. So the risk of post-ICU PTSD is in the order of 16 to 48%, depends wow. whose data you look at, but it isn't small. And so for me, a lot of that is really trauma. The flashbacks, the nightmares are a, a trauma. There are some really, really useful non-pharmacological approaches to that. So, yeah, I mean, pharmacy works uh, and, and counselling works, but there are a couple of wonderful things that we use specifically for PTSD. So... Uh, there's a technique called dream rehearsal therapy. So people write down the content of their nightmare and then you get them to change the ending so that they don't fall off a cliff or the car doesn't run over them. Something good happens and you get them to keep writing down that happier memory. And in some way, that action means that the 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 memory suppression occurs, <clears throat> and so there's a group. Uh, I know VA in America have done this. Uh, there's a group in Melbourne uh, at Monash who share similar interests with me, who uh, are advocates of dream rehearsal therapy, and it certainly is effective. The other is um, eye movement desensitization, which has been known about for some years. It's a kind of, uh, you basically give the person a, a, an item or a finger to follow. What that really does is, is kind of mimics uh, the, the eye movements of, of REM. Mm -hmm. uh, so in REM, it's called eye, rapid eye movement, but it's not all that rapid because the eyes are moving left to right, left to right. So you're kind of mimicking that pattern almost like a hypnosis. And... You have to have a really good 
EMDR person and someone with whom you have a good therapeutic relationship because it brings up the content of the nightmares. Uh, and so it can be really vivid, like watching a movie. The art to it is to to allow people to see that and to desensitise them to it. And so EMDR is incredibly effective uh, for nightmare disorder. Oh, dream rehearsal therapy. And then there are other uh, uh, things um, one of the ones I'm most interested in is um, expressive art therapy. Um, that is done, uh, huge amounts of expressive art therapy are done at Walter Reed. Um, okay. I don't think Donald did it, but probably <laughs> couldn't draw anyway. Really but expressive art therapy, again, is it's not just about drawing. It's it's about other things. It's It's about using tools to uh, to allow people to find space, um, and it's a, a a wonderful therapy, um, and so I I have a uh, an expert in expressive art therapy that I use for PTSD people, um, but the nightmares are also something of, of huge concern to guys like me. One of the problems is this dopaminergic state. And what I'm seeing, which is really a bit concerning, is a, a significant increase in uh, REM behaviour disorder. REM behaviour disorder is the loss of that normal paralysis that occurs in dream sleep. So when you go into dream sleep, you literally lose control of all your voluntary muscles. And so what we do to evaluate REM behaviour disorder in the lab is we put a couple of additional electrodes onto voluntary muscles, usually in the upper limb or leg. What we're looking for is whether, is whether there's a flat line, which is what you should see. So, you know, there's muscle activity, you go into REM and it just drops right out. So there's no muscle activity. But in those who have sustained muscle activity in REM, that is the hallmark of REM behaviour disorder. Why would it matter? Because people can occasionally live out the violence of their dreams. Yeah. They don't know they're doing it. And so, you know, jumping out of bed and flying into a cupboard or you know, screaming or sitting upright, uh, you know, choking a pillow, whatever, I've heard them all, um, is something to certainly be concerned about. The, the indications for treating it are obviously someone harming themselves or their partner. This is a condition that we've long known about. We also have long recognised that you know, in the old days, we used to think of it as a condition of men over the age of 50. Um, and we knew that there was a significant increased risk or association with the development of Parkinson's later. So, in fact, REM behaviour disorder or the centre for that starts below the centre um, for uh, Parkinson's, which is the substantia nigra. So... We've long realised that the process starts further down on the motherboard. The substantia nigra is basically a bystander. The reason for saying that is that we know that if you follow many of these people over 16 years or so, 80% of them are going to get Parkinson's. Wow. What is alarming to guys like me as neurobiologists is the clear and obvious evidence that this is a dopamine senescent disease. Um, it is clearly um, hastens those who already have Parkinson's or early dementia. It gets them to a place in six months that would have taken them six years. So it really cranks that process along. So REM behaviour disorder is is for me a really substantial and important marker in sleep in people with long COVID 
because I'm seeing this in in men and women, you know, under the age of forty five. Oh, yeah. Um the the youngest I have is, is twenty two. Um and you know, you you have to have this discussion and say, look, we realise that there's this association. Because they're going to Google it, um, yeah, and then yeah. they're going to get right. frightened. And so, for me, the, this increasing uh, observation of of REM behaviour disorder um, is something that we really need to go looking for uh, in a lot of people because it has implications for how they may um, manage. Uh, or what may happen to them. So we, we know that influenza, uh, the 1918 pandemic, it took oh, 15 years or more uh, before uh, people developed Parkinson's, which was really what the movie Awakenings was all about, um, which is this kind of myalgia in, you know, um, in whatever it was called, uh, encephalitis. It was basically Parkinson's uh, and Awakenings was about giving them dopamine. Um, and so we know that um, with, with, with flu, uh, some in a proportion, not, not, not that many, uh, there's this long time lag to Parkinson's. What concerns me is that this isn't the flu. Uh, this is a much more virulent neurotropic virus and we're seeing every day I see more papers on brain and so I'm concerned that you know there is going to be a fair number of people um, who are going to develop uh, Parkinson's or Parkinsonian type of symptoms um, much earlier than we saw with flu. Yeah. You know, we're only five years into this, you know, and 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 that's, you know, just bad shit. It is. It, it, it's frightening. Mm. I, I see it in my group even. Um, yeah. And so, it, again, nightmares equals sleep study yeah. with the extra electrodes, which is called the sin bar montage. You'll see me tweet about that from time to time. Oh, yeah. Um, it's really the defining, it's the defining tool for this condition. Um, it's not hard to do. It's just a couple of extra limb leads. And okay. we're finding in our lab a whole lot of it. Wow. So my sleep tech said to me, what is it with you and all these yeah. REM behaviour disorder people? I said, well, dude, it's COVID. Put your mask on. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they did. Exactly, as they should. Well, I'm, well, I'm always in a mask. Well, what do you reckon? Yeah, for a good reason. Mm. I'm tired of being sick all the time. Little mask up. Uh huh. Oh my gosh. I'm too fatigued. The, the to end... Oh, go ahead, David. Oh, yeah. That, no, no. Uh, what I was going to say, because it comes to the next question, uh, is that the inverse of REM behavior disorder um, is narcolepsy. Yeah. That's where people. Um, have the paralysis of REM, but they're awake. So it's, uh -huh. if you like, the exact inverse paradigm. And so instead of lo losing paralysis when you're asleep, you actually, and without the violence of your dreams, you actually um, have the paralysis when you're awake. And it manifests as sleep paralysis. So I'm seeing more of that. Yeah. So young people who wake up can't move, it's a bit scary. Often uh, they have what we call hypnagogic hallucinations. So they have this really vivid dreamlike mentation at sleep onset. They really feel like there's someone sitting on the bed or there's someone in the bed. And, you know, they don't often want to mention it because I think people think they're nuts. But if you ask them in the right way, uh, a lot of them will tell you that they have these kind of weird dreamlike things. And then there's cataplexy, so triggered by emotion, be that good, bad or other, uh, people will get a sense of, of weakness. So they will um, kind of melt, if you like, to the floor if they're laughing or crying. 
because they are losing tone in their, 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 their axial muscles. That's the REM side of it, but it is associated with profound and intrusive sleepiness. And that's the aspect of it that I think is really crucial in uh, long COVID uh, because A, there are very good treatments and B, the intrusive somnolence, uh, it may just be long COVID, but there's no treatments for that. Whereas narcolepsy definitely is a therapy, you know, it's a, a condition for which we have therapies. So stimulants, wakefulness promoting agents in America, you have access to ones I would love to have. Right. Um, but it's, it's, it's a really important diagnosis to make uh, because it may account for some of the, the tiredness and the lethargy and the sleepiness. Um, and there are therapies for that. Um, it's an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we know an awful lot about, you know, the the new autoimmunopathies of long COVID or post-COVID. So the Germans have identified 21 previously unrecognised G-couple autoimmune proteins just in the brain. Oh, wow. Remarkably, one of them is very specific or narcolepsy so it's always on my radar that those with you know post-covid prolonged sleepiness they need a sleep study they need uh, an additional daytime test mslt to look for narcolepsy which was yeah. the next question about the tiredness yes. yeah yeah let's see this one we, we sort of covered this a little bit but um my sleep tracker says I'm waking up at least a dozen times at night, but all I notice is that I'm always exhausted. How do I self, how do I make myself stay asleep? <laughs> well, <laughs> you kind of, yeah, you know, yeah. You, you, the, the question is um, uh, about um, things like trackers. So, you know, I've got a, a, yeah. a an Apple watch. Um, we're very interested uh, in, in these kinds of bio tools. Um, so Raina McIntyre, who's from the Kirby Institute, who most people would know, uh, Global Biosec. Uh, Raina and I have spoken a lot about using things like Garmin's and Apple Watches and other things to look at everything from sleep cycle the oximetry measurements, the ECG stuff, not as fabulously sensitive as they'd want to be. But you do get a good sense of sleep. And so we look at it in terms of active sleep and quiet sleep. And so the 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 algorithms are getting better. But you can't tell REM on a watch. That's all crap. You just okay. can't. You need eye electrodes and an EEG. Yeah. But what you can tell is when the heart rate dips and obviously the blood pressure falls and there's not a lot of movement. So it's a combination of algorithmic measurements of movement and a drop in heart rate um, or heart rate variability that is such a good marker of deep or slow wave sleep. Now, for those with long COVID who've got autonomic dysfunction, Clearly, you, you may not see uh, that, you know, drop in heart rate or that uh, degree of variability because they just constantly, um, you know, sort of tachycardic. And so what you may be seeing on the watch may not be a true measure of what's actually happening. And that to me is why, you know, a sleep study is, is again, warranted when you're seeing things uh, on people's watches or their biometrics that you can't readily explain. But often it is just simply the, uh, the autonomic stuff. So it's just that there's not that heart rate variability uh, that you would see otherwise. And so the algorithm can't figure that out. Yeah. Does that answer that? Yeah, I think so. I think so. 
I, I told them similarly. They are really interested in those biometrics. Yeah, and it's it's something that we we really want to look at. So if we do get the pittance of funding that we've asked for, <laughs> um, looking at, uh, yeah, well, you know, we we get get nothing. Um, we have to get Petrino to lend us some of his. I think. All right, give it Seems a mug. Give it a mug. Well. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, Dave's got Amy Prohl and uh, all right. the poly bio guys and yeah i might have to be really nice when he comes to visit in june and see if i can make him some cookies please a few dollars out <laughs> <laughs> but, but we, re we really are we re I, I i did offer him a very good whiskey uh no, that one, no, we, we, one, we really are interested in those in the those in those markers i mean these you know these tools uh, are more than just for exercise. And so, yeah. you know, whether we can can actually, because what we're really interested in is, is prospective cardiovascular outcomes. And so it may be a really good marker uh, for those who are at risk of cardiovascular or vascular outcomes because they don't have necessarily good heart rate variability or they're just constantly tachycardic during sleep. Yeah. And don't feel rested. Obviously, they don't. They're not getting it. Yeah, and I think that really answers another question that we had down here. Um, but I'm going to skip to number 10 because I, I see this so much. And I swear, people post about this almost daily in the group where they they have, they have this problem where I, uh, I'll just read it, where I feel like I'm not breathing. It's a feeling of having to manually breathe and since the signal isn't being sent from the brain that I'm breathing. And it's terrifying. It's like the brain just stops automatically breathing. But when I check my pulse ox, it's okay. Um, what is this manual breathing feeling? Why is it happening? Is there anything I can do to help with it? And I think you and I have talked about this before. Yeah, look, it's it's <clears throat> the, the mechanisms that underlie breathlessness are, are incredibly complicated. <clears throat> Some years ago, uh, I co-authored a paper with my PhD supervisor uh, about uh, the mechanisms of breathlessness. So it's been a thing that, you know, uh, has long interested me. Uh, he, he was a wonderful physiologist. I was second rate. Uh, but it it is many things. So what drives the sense of breathlessness isn't necessarily low oxygen, but fluctuations in CO2, respiratory muscles, upper airway muscles, uh, um, the receptors in the neck, uh, and obviously the, you know, the, the breathing centre, if you like, down on the motherboard that's trying to synthesise all of this. One of the commonest uh, reasons for people to, to have a, a sense of it's often air hunger is the term that people will describe this sense of needing to take a deep breath they feel like they can't get a big enough breath they can't get air into their lungs to be honest that is more often over ventilation those who are already um breathing at a um, not not a faster rate but just just a deeper rate so sitting at rest um taking 12 breaths a minute you will breathe in and out five liters of air what these people do is they still take 12 breaths they're just much bigger so they're blowing off 12 liters of air a minute the end result of that is it doesn't affect your oxygen, but your CO2 falls. And that fall in CO2 triggers a whole plethora of, um, 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 stomatic sensations is probably the best term from yeah. tingling around the lips to, uh, pins and needles to funny feelings, dizziness, fuzziness in the head. But the, the, the hallmark is often the sense that they need to take a bigger breath in. So, you know, it makes sense to me that people have got a disturbance of CO2, particularly if they've suffered uh, lung injury, 
So the, the problem with the lung damage of COVID is that the interface of the vessel um, and the alveolus and the bit in between. So oxygen transfer is, uh, isn't so fantastic, but CO2 transfer is still very effective. So we often see that in people who've got cardiac failure or fibrotic lung disease, their CO2 is actually low or low normal. Um, and so that not only creates more central sleep apnea, um, but it also gives them a um, this awful feeling of needing to take a deep breath. So for me, um, again, um, measurement is everything. Um, there are ways to 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 look at it from uh, an arterial blood gas um, to cardiopulmonary exercise testing, but you want to be very mindful about pops yeah. and PEMS when you do that. Um, and so, you know, um, you know, we we're very mindful. There's a paper from uh, Ray Duncan and my friend Mark Fay. They just published uh, yeah. talking about the value of this test, but you know, with its limitations. The often the simplest thing to do is to use an app. So there are lots of apps, uh, including your illustrious. Uh, general surgeon general who seems to be into muppets and calm yeah but there are oh yeah yeah he's made a huge contribution to the world i feel i feel so reassured like the cdc um there are some really good apps uh that you can use um for a technique called box breathing so how am i get interested in all of this well box breathing is something that navy seals are trained to do and so when i first read about it i asked my british special forces guys went, oh, oh yeah doc, everyone's taught how to do that yeah, box breathing mate yeah you settles your nerves so you take a shot i'm like okay well maybe i don't want to take a shot but <laughs> tell me how it works and so it's a it's a, a four second inspiration and then a four second breath hold, then a four second expiration and a four second breath hold. That's why it's called box breathing. The reason that seals are taught to do this is that it calms them. And so it allows that CO2 to drift up. So it's a form of controlled breathing that we don't use nearly enough. And there are buckets of apps because I've looked that will give you uh, on your phone or whatever, the message to you know so the the little circle gets bigger and says hold your breath and now exhale and hold your breath and so you can do it with your phone um and it's it's really a very effective tool for those who, who have this kind of perceptive sense of um of of disordered breathing i hate the term functional breathing that's yeah. you know that's something that respiratory physicians label everyone with long COVID is having functional breathing no no they don't they they have a physiological abnormality that yeah. clearly drives the sensation and box breathing and breathing apps are pretty damn defective so there's a tip all right well, I think we, we've really covered everything else and I want to be mindful of our time with you. So uh, any parting thoughts, any parting words? Um, yeah, I, I think it's important to realize that a, a sleep study is a an extraordinarily invaluable yeah. biological tool. It's more than just, you know, the question, you know, sleep studies are for apnea, not apnea. No, that's crap. Sleep yeah. studies are for lots of things. Yeah. They are to look at motor restlessness. They are to look at the pattern of breathing. They allow us an insight into people's respiratory reserves in sleep. They let us see whether they are going to have uh, problems with respiratory failure much earlier than waiting until they turn up in the ED. Right. 
But last but not least, it's a, a neurobiological tool. So sleep in its essence, from the moment you're born to the nail you in a hole, is light sleep, deep sleep, dream sleep, light sleep, deep sleep, dream sleep in a very rigid pattern. Obviously, when we're infants, we have more REM, our brains are growing. In adolescence, uh, you have more slow wave sleep. That's well recognized because that's when you release growth hormone. And, um, you know, I wonder how many short people we're going to have with kids with long COVID and diminished slow wave. But from adulthood, that's largely the group I'm dealing with. It's a very rigid pattern. So when you see people who are having a virtual absence of REM or very little slow wave sleep or the architecture is, you know, is back to front, um, that's absolutely incredibly invaluable information. It tells you a lot about what's going on in their brain. It is eight hours of um, of neurobiological information. What we're measuring is the brain's electrical activity during the one thing that you will do more than anything else in your life. By the time you are 70, you will have been asleep for 28 years. What the hell else do you do that much? Well, <laughs> unless unless you're a parliamentarian or something, then you tend to do a lot more sleeping. Um, but you know, to me, it's a, it's a crucial tool. Um, and I would suggest to people that, uh, if they have access to good sleep positions with an interest that they, they take their, you know, they take this on board and, 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 and seek help because help's available. Um, whether it's narcolepsy, whether it's restless legs, uh, whether it's early morning waking and insomnia, whether it's REM behavior disorder, whether it's nightmares, there are therapies. Uh, and so knowing about dream rehearsal therapy, eye movement desensitization, which agents you can use that are not benzodiazepines, those are the crucial messages for me. It's it's a huge area um, and, and one that um, uh, we're going to need. There's no question that yeah. you, know, you can't ignore the eight hours of your life that are so crucial to how you function. And it's everything to how your brain works. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, have a fantastic weekend. I yeah. shall do. I shall do. I, um, I'm going to go and do whatever they told me I have to do in the kitchen. So I'm, I'm, in, <laughs> I'm in Melbourne for my, my, my stepson's wedding and oh, I may have to put on something more than a T-shirt, but there you go. Oh, At least yeah. it's, in a, it's, it's, it's in a park, so it's oh, nice. outdoors. So. Yeah, yeah. So they're very That's COVID good. safe. So I, I get Wonderful. that. Yeah. Well, when I think of Melbourne, mm -hmm. I always think of Miss Fisher's Murder Mysteries, which is like, bring it back. Oh, please. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look, there's there's not a lot not to like about Melbourne. He said as yeah. a Sydney person, uh, but I'm <laughs> fond of it. Well, you have a fantastic time. Thank you for being here. <laughs> Look, thank you so much for the invitation and I, I hope Absolutely. that whatever I've said is some value to those looking for help and to all of you long COVIDs out there, like I think of you all the time because it just sucks and, yes. you know, we're just trying to find answers, trying to put it together. Well, thank you for your work. And that. as, you know, as they say in the movie, show me your money. Uh, show me stay you have a great day you too Bye. yeah show me show me your money that's what we need <laughs> money for research <laughs>